Hi, my name is Nico, and let's talk about views. No, let's talk about one view. We have introduced a new technology in C++20, it's called views, and there are a few things you should know about it. And uh, we have a couple of views, a couple in C++20, even more in C++23. Well, there are a few issues you should know about this. While in the past I have mainly complained, now let's uh, just look at one specific view and see how to use it right, or what are all the essence and all the things you should definitely avoid. And that is, let's look at the filter view and how to use it, because that's one of the most important views we have. We want to filter elements of a collection. I think that's a pretty common use case. And you should know how to do that and you should especially know what not to do. So this is a, a view. No, this is a vector. This is a container. And this container, let's print the elements of this container. I hope you can see it in the back a little bit. So that's uh, all the elements we can print. And I have here another container. Let's use a set and let's print all the elements there. So far there are no views. That's just common code. And we can print this and we can uh, apply and enable this code by having a print function that takes a template parameter, a generic collection, iterates over the elements of this collection and prints out the elements with a space inside and at the end a new line. So far that's code you all know. So in C++20 we have the ability instead of using template parameters to use auto and to qualify auto with some constraints, like for example here saying it has to be a range, we iterate over and we read the elements, so it's an it input range. We read only once, so that's fine. Good. So, now let's look at views. We have a feature called take, for example, where we can say let's take from this view the first three elements, or Let's take from another view three elements. And while this syntax requires nesting, there's another nice syntax, which means uh, let's use a pipeline for that. So let's say, let's print out all the elements of collection one piped into the take, into a view that takes only the first three elements and do the same for the second view. By the way, if you wonder why with the second collection the elements have different order, it's a set which internally automatically sorts the elements. So, and we can combine these uh, filter elements and uh, these uh, pipeline elements and say um, let's take the second collection, only the first three elements, transform the elements to convert them into strings and then append an S and let's print all these elements, so pass that, the whole thing, to a print function and here it is, that's the output. So that's the basics and the cool basics of C++ views. So there are a couple of other examples. This is a nice example. Um, let's iterate over a map. A map is where the elements are key value pairs. So let's have a couple of composers of classic music and their year of birth. So we map the name to the year of birth. And so let's, uh, yeah, let's iterate over, yeah, let's iterate over some of them. Well, let's only iterate over those who were born after 700. And I also only need the, the names. So, yeah, let's uh, pass. So let's on the right-hand side of the range-based for loop use uh, not just the composers, apply a filter. And that's a filter view. Um, looking at the second element, which is um, the name, uh, the, the year of birth, whether it's greater or equal 700. Let's take the first three of them, and then let's take, so because the elements are key value pairs, let's take only the names, and that's it. Yeah, and that is where we iterate over with this range-based for loop. So an ad hoc, what we ad hoc create is, yeah, a view 
on this components, um, filtering out only some elements, filtering out uh, by value, filtering out by position, and then um, taking only part of the elements to, to a transformation, convert the pair into just the keys. Last example, um, let's use an IOTA view, which is a um, cheap container to generate numbers starting from one, so one, two, three, four, five. Let's have a filter so that we only allow to use multiples of three. Let's drop the first three elements. Let's take the next eight elements. Let's have a transformation with the elements and then pass the whole view on the right-hand side of a range-based for loop. So that's the result, 12, 15, 18, until 33 seconds we have here. Yeah, eight elements, first three skipped, and only multiples of three. Cool, great technology, everybody loves that. Um, how does it work? It is important to understand how this works. So, because this is, for example, not working like a Unix pipe, um, this is totally different. And the approach is roughly as follows. If we have a vector, then the key API we use in each and every container and every collection and every range we have is we have an interface where we iterate from begin to the end over all these elements. So if we print out the elements, what we have to do is let's initialize an iterator with the begin and start to iterate with plus plus over the elements as long as we are not at the end and with star we go to the value. So we iterate with the position, with star we go to the value and that is the key API we are using here of a container and we having this API since C++ 98. It is one, it's probably the key reason for the success story of C++, because we have one way to be able to deal with all these different containers, because at the end, you iterate from begin to end. And that's also internally called by the range-based for loop. Now, please note what we do here step by step. So, for example, we asked for the collection for the begin, and then um, we get the position of the 47, then we go to that value, print it out, and with plus plus we go to the next element, with star we print it out, with plus plus we go to the next element, and so on, and so on, and so on. This API we also want to apply to views. So now let's, instead of printing all the elements of this vector, let's use a view. Well, let's use two views here. So one is um, that we take the collection and pipe into a filter view, and that's what we talk ta today talk about. And that filter view says, let's only use elements which are, which are greater than 10. No, less than 20, okay. It's similar. <laughs> well, next, later slide, I have greater than nine. I don't know. Okay, so less than 20. Okay, and then pipe the whole thing into a transformation, negating all the elements, just as one example. So here's how it works. As I told you, the pipeline is just a short and, and special syntax of the following that we say, let's apply the filter view on the collection, applying the filter. That filters on the elements that are less than 20. And then on that view, we pass that view as input to a transformation view uh, saying now, and if we need each value, let's negate the value. So that is, the pipeline is just another syntax for, for what you see here. The interesting thing is, as you see on the right, that each view does not create elements as we would do it in Unix if we have a pipeline. So we generate values, the values are stored in a queue, and then comes the next part of the processing. We don't create any element yet. We uh, just describe and specify how we want to process the elements. So uh, all we have created is roughly this data structure you see on the right. We have 
a collection providing the usual I I I API to iterate over elements. On that, we wrap the collection with a view. The only information inside the view is um, we need a reference to the uh, underlying collection and then the predicate. So how, how do we want to filter? And at the outside, again, we provide the usual API of having begin and and for the iterators, plus plus star and equals equals and so on. And the same we had is happens if we now use a transformation. It's again a wrapper on that view. And that means let's negate all the values. So let's uh, iterate from begin to end, again, using the same API as we have used before in print to print all the elements of a collection. So that is the situation we have here. Nothing has been processed yet. We only created data structures. Now, let's start to iterate. And that is the moment we create values and we print values and we deal with elements. So at first, let's uh, call begin. So we call begin for v2, for the transformation view. That begin call goes to begin for the filter view. That call goes to begin for the collection. And the collection says, OK, you want the first element? Yes, here it is. It's the position of 47. It's an iterator. It's not the value. It's a position of 47. So this position comes to the filter view. And the filter view looks at that and says, you know what? I only allow certain values. So I need the value. So what the filter view now does, it says, oh, it called star to say, here, let me go to the value. And then it looks at the value and says, that's not OK. So I need, that's not an element I can accept. So um, I, it goes to that view and says, plus, plus. And with that plus plus, we get the position of the next element here in the filter. With star, we again look at the 11. And that is OK. So two things happen here. The filter is a little bit tricky and therefore also a little bit expensive and more expensive than other views. The filter to, to deal with elements needs both the position, an iterator, and the value, because it has to decide whether to uh, let it through. So with that information, what does the filter pass to the wrapper? Not the value. It passes the position. It only needs the value to um, know, um, yeah, yes or no, I use it. So we are, we are still at begin for the transformation. Transformation is still waiting for the first element. And uh, that is what is coming back here. The second element is coming back to the transformation. The transformation just passes it through to the caller. So the caller gets the position, an iterator that indirectly refers to the second element of the collection. That's then the state. OK. So we want to print out the value. <laughs> We just called begin. And um, now let's print the value. So um, we go from our iterator we got back from the transformation and say, let's start. So go to the value that is delegated the queue up and says, but wait a minute, when we go to the value, then the transformation says something. Oh, wait a minute, when we need the value, I have here uh, something to do with the value. So let's negate it. So when you want to have the value, I negate it. And that is a value that comes back with the star operation, and we print it out. So that's it. You see a couple of things here. So um, for example, um, begin might be become very expensive. So think about the first 1,000 elements are uh, greater than 20. So we iterate over all these elements, look at the value, and that takes time. That's a linear operation. Um, if we double the elements that are greater than 
20, at the beginning of that collection, it we double the performance, the, the, the time it takes to find the begin. So begin can become pretty expensive. And which is new. So far, before C++20, we didn't have any container where begin was expensive. So, okay. We have it. Let's go to the next element. That is, again, propagated through all the views to the collection that goes to the next position. So we had the position of the 11, so now we go to the zero. Filter looks at the value. Value is okay. Filter gives that position to the transformation. Transformation says, um, yeah, I give it back because it, I only care when we look at the value. It comes back, but when we then look at the value, transformation says, oh, and by the way, let's negate the value. And that happens so on and so on. So next time we call plus plus from the outside, um, the filter calls plus plus twice because one element does not fulfill the requirement. And then at the end, when we call plus plus for the last time, then um, yeah, we jump to the usual end or it's not clear that we, we logically get this position, but at the end that means that this view returns something that is equivalent to end, its end. It returns its end. It says that's it. And that is here um, now the end of the whole collection. So the loop, if this is step by step what we do in a loop, at the end the position is at the end, so we have done our iteration. Okay. Good. Performance. We have to talk about the performance of this. We are run into trouble. As we have just discussed, if there are 1,000 leading elements, begin suddenly becomes expensive. So we have to deal with that in some way. How, is, how expensive is this? Is begin? That's one question we have. So let's look at it. And let's use, for example, a simple example and say, let's have a filter on a vector. So, and in this case, let me start with a different view. That's a drop view. That's simply a view that says, let's skip the first three elements. Okay, um, we call begin. Begin goes to the vector and then, well, because of drop, Drop says, let's ignore three values, but fortunately, we don't have to call three times plus plus because we have a vector inside. So a vector allows random access so we can jump directly to the fourth element. But that is what, we, what is happening under the hood. Even if we go to the thousandth element, it would not be very expensive to call begin here. Just two cards. So uh, in a list, it's different. If we have a list, the problem is we don't have random access there. So if we have, say, we want to drop the first three elements, uh, that means we have to three times, three, three times call, to call three times, I think that's correct English, um, three times plus plus. And of course you see, that this is significant, more expensive. Again, if we go, if we drop 1,000 elements, this begin becomes incredible expensive. Well, incredible, there are worse things <laughs> in uh, programs, but it matters. So begin is cheap in this, when, uh, for a drop on a vector, begin is expensive for a drop on a list. And the key, the question is, do we have random access? Can we jump ahead in elements? And if yes, uh, as we have for a vector, that's cheap. If not, that's, that's expensive. Okay. Now, let's come back to our example. We want to talk about a filter. Now, some people seeing that slide and some programmer seeing that slide says, okay, so I should use a, a vector only as a container, and I'm fine with performance. 
Well, no. Yes, um, if, we, if we have a list, and instead of drop, we are using a filter. Um, now, my, the example is greater than nine. So um, let's call begin. We cannot come, we, we have to look at each element and find the first element that is greater than nine. Good. This is in this case also the fourth element. And so three times we call plus plus, similar to the drop example. But with a vector, this time it doesn't get better because, as we have discussed, uh, we can only uh, know whether which one is a, is a fourth element if we look at all the values of all the elements. So we have to inspect all the values and that means we have to go plus, 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 and I should maybe even tell here that together with plus, plus, we call star. So we even look at the value of this uh, element to decide whether this is the right position or not. Begin becomes expensive. So even for vectors, if we use a filter view. So in, in, in fact, if you use a filter view, it's always expensive because uh, we have to look at each value of each element to decide which one is the fourth value or uh, which one is the first value that fits or whatsoever. Um, there is some rumor that C++ cares for performance. And therefore, we have the standard template library saying, you know, with some iterators, you might be able to call push front. With some, you can't, depending on whether it's cheap or not. With some iterators, you can jump ahead three elements. With some, you can't, depending on whether jumping ahead three elements has good performance. Some containers provide the index operator, some do not, depending on whether the index operator is cheap. And the same principle applies here. We want to protect you from bad performance. Now one way is we teach you all. The other way is we don't let you program bad performance. So let's look. Hmm. OK, when we have a vector and we want to drop n elements. Let's look at some of the typical things we might call for the container as a whole. So let's call begin, let's call empty, let's call size, let's use the index operator. And it turns out everything is more or less cheap. Well, by cheap we mean doesn't matter how many elements we have, we can directly jump to the right element. Um, we can directly find out whether it's empty we can directly find out the size because um, the, we just have to subtract from the size of the vector the size uh, of this drop parameter. And, uh, and we can directly jump to the nth element. We just have to add n to the element. So all these operations are cheap. Good. Let's take a list and drop. And you just saw already that begin became expensive. So we have to, uh, yeah, we have to n times call plus plus. And um, MT is fast because we don't have to uh, iterate through the elements because um, a list has a size member. Size is um, fast for the same reason. And the index operator is slow again. So we have to go to begin and then, um, so n times we have to drop skip elements, and then idx times we, again, iterate through the next element. So that's even worse than begin. We want to protect you, so let us only provide you what is good to use. And the surprising answer is we skip the index operator, but not begin. But it's not so surprising. If we have not, no begin anymore, we have a problem in uh, iterating from begin to end. So that's a key uh, operation we need. So now let's use a filter. And it doesn't matter what the, under the hood we have um, a view and a, 
um, a drop view or uh, we have, um, excuse me, whether under the hood we have a vector or whether we have a list. Everything is expensive. So it's more, more expensive or even more, more expensive. So begin, yeah, we have to apply the predicate until the, we, the first time we find an element that is true. So guess we have one million elements. We're looking for the first element that's greater than 20. If there is no element greater than 20, we iterate through the whole collection and find out there is none. Which also answers the question, is the range em empty or not? Uh, when we apply the filter, it's as slow as the previous example. Um, because we only let empty is just, it's the begin, the end. <laughs> So that's it. So size, size is interesting. Size uh, says, uh, let's uh, apply the predicate a couple of times. Well, we ha again, we have to iterate over all the elements. So that's even worse than begin, because begin only goes to the first fitting element. So size is even worse because we not with begin, we don't stop. We go even further and, and have to really look at each element. And uh, index uh, has the same problem. To jump to an element, we have to know where's the fifth element. For that reason, we have to look which element counts and which one not. So we have um, a yeah, e similar problem like size. So again, let's discuss um, what do we provide as an API for a filter view? Um, you know what, size we don't like and index we don't like. Empty is okay. Okay, good. Yeah, because it's easy. I mean, begin is okay. Uh, it's not okay, but <laughs> without begin, we cannot use that whole s system. And when we know begin, we know whether it's empty. So then we have it. Size is not there, so that's interesting. Vector filter has no size member. So we usually think we have a size member in collections. Um, the only exception is the forward list, which does not have a size member. Now we get a lot more ranges where we have no size member. And now that becomes interesting because if we now drop elements, we need the size. <laughs> or find out when we drop it, whether it's empty, we need the size. But we cannot cheaply compute the size. There is no size. <laughs> so suddenly, having a drop behind a filter becomes interesting for some reasons. Okay. Hmm. So, how do we deal with that problem? And now we come to some issues. I mean, you have seen already some issues, but now the question is, how do we deal with the constraints and the performance constraints we have? So far it looks, yeah, if you have a drop, the index might work, might not work, um, if you have a filter, size might not be there. Well, if you need a container that needs size, size, you might have a problem afterwards. So a filter in front might cause some trouble. Good. So let's start to use the whole machinery. And um, we all learn by example. We look at simple examples and say, oh, that's cool. I understand. I, I, I. You look at two examples and say, oh, I understand how it works. And uh, yeah, vector, print, cool. List, print, cool. Vector, pipe to take, cool. List, pipe to take, cool. Vector, pipe to drop, cool. List, pipe to drop, not so cool. those who have seen my keynote here last year, know 
I was in the in a close to depression when I got this problem. Because I didn't know about that. I just thought, what the hell is going on here? Okay, so usually when you come into such a problem, you do try out a few things. So what I tried out, put list to drop at the right-hand side of a range-based for loop, and it works. Yeah, uh, no, <laughs> why? <laughs> okay, so um, yes, why? Okay, so here's the answer. As I told you, and as we just found out, begin may become expensive. So on a drop, it's expensive if the underlying container is, a vec is a, not a vector, so not a random access range. So if it's a random access range, everything is nice. If not, there's a problem with um, that we have to call plus, 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 and plus, plus. So somebody calls begin and then calls empty on the same view. Oh, then we twice have on the right-hand side to, to call begin and then three times plus, plus. And if we drop 1,000 elements, we have to call 1,000 times plus, plus. So we came up with a cool idea. Let's cache begin once we find it. So begin modifies the view. If we have a filter, we have the same. So if you call begin, um, you look at each element, even at the values, so that I should uh, fix the slide to say plus plus comma star, comma star, comma star. And then we have found the element, that the first element that fits, and that's 47 here. So now we have the position of 47. We never want to do that expensive computation again anymore because now we know where begin is. So let's cache begin. And that also applies if we have a vector under the filter because, again, we have to look at each element, whether this value applies. And so what we do, we cache begin. Caching begin has some interesting consequences. So let's summarize here that some C++ views cache begin. So a filter does it all times. Drop, for example, sometimes, depending on what's inside, what we drop on. And these are only the, the facts on C++20 views. In C++23, we have even more that cache. So that has an interesting consequence. So the first begin might be more expensive than the second begin for a view. So just for a container, calling begin is constant time. So it doesn't matter how much elements we have, begin is cheap. And also, by the way, size, and also empty is cheap. We just return the value because we have all information inside. If we apply drop, it depends whether we drop on a vector or on a list. And if we drop on a list, then the first call has to iterate and find the right element. And, but the second call of begin is cheap. Everything else is cheap. If we have a filter, we have the problem even if the, we have a filter on a vector. So the first begin is cheap. The others are, uh, ex uh, excuse me, the first begin is linear, so it's expensive. The others are cheap. Size we don't apply, provide. Okay, and empty is also, the first call of empty is cheap, uh, unless we already had begin, so one of them having called, initializes the other. Yeah. In the C++ standard, we have a nice saying about that. In the C++ standard, we say, begin is amortized constant. 
Uh, that is interesting because normally we say constant, it means this size does not matter. Linear means, well, we grow linearly. So we double the number of elements, we double the, the, the amount of time it takes to iterate through, over the elements and to do something with the elements. So amortized constant means, um, yeah, it might be expensive, but over time it becomes cheap. Only once or a few times it's expensive. Well, unfortunately, the first time, but because, so that means always it starts expensive. So, and it's interesting, we have a new requirement in the standard, in C++ 20, we introduce um, concepts as named requirements, and we say um, the requirement of a range is not that begin as cheap which would be true for all containers, but not for all views. So we say now, a range is cheap if it's amortized constant. So that means the first begin might be incredible bad, have incredible bad performance. But the, with the second begin, it becomes better. That's a little bit cheating. That sounds, oh, all is great. Now, how often do you call begin when you iterate over elements? Usually one time. And do you reuse that? Rarely. So uh, I would say, <clears throat> excuse me, but in 99% of all use cases, begin is expensive now. And it's linear now, not amortized constant. That's marketing. Good. So, that's one thing, that's one consequence. So, but there are more consequences. And now we come to the point why the code did no longer compile. Because the point was, when we here pipe a list into a drop, we modify the view. The, we modify the view because we cache begin. And the whole problem, what we have, and have, we have also, if you use a filter, you, let's call print vector pass to a filter, that does not compile. Because we cache begin. Print at the beginning calls begin, begin modifies the view, and unfortunately, there's a const, which is very typical because we learned it 15, 20 years that it's perfectly fine to iterate over the elements of containers when you declare the containers to be const. Fuck. All your code iterating over elements, just reading them, declaring them cons, does no longer work for some views. This video is not allowed to be shown in US, huh? No, hmm. okay. Good, no, not good, bad. Because obviously that <laughs> confuses programmers. So why does that, that not compile? And, and trust me, the error message is not nice. So at this point, I started to claim and said, um, um, excuse me, why the hell did we standardize that? We come to the answer later. Um, and what should I do now? <laughs> what, I, what, should I do to, what should I teach to my programmers? There was no real answer. Well, or to say, I got 15 answers. So one of them was saying, oh, that's, that's easy. Let's take a, a subrange of a list piped into a drop instead. So that's the only thing you have to teach your, to your programmers. Okay. 
Because a subrange is a view that internally caches begin. <laughs> and for that reason, suddenly it works. Well, it caches begin. And because it initializes begin um, at when it's initialized, so when it's declared, and therefore we, we don't have to, the first begin call does not modify the view anymore. Yeah, so you only have to write the code as follows. Call print for a subrange of a vector piped into a filter. Easy to teach, huh? Good. Next option was, um, let's use um, universal references, auto with two ampersand. Some standard fellows call that forwarding references, which is a little bit silly because um, this is not forwarding. This is forwarding if you call forward on a universal reference. But forward reference, the, the uni term universal reference came from Scott Myers, and some people don't like Scott Myers in the standard computer. Sorry? That's off the record. Ah, oh, damn, that's record. <laughs> Good. Doesn't matter. Human beings. We are human beings when we standardize. Sometimes it's really a little bit strange. Okay, good. Anyway, I call this universal reference uh, because it's universally referring to something. It can refer to L values, to R values. That means to temporary objects or objects with names. So universal reference is a very good name for that. And the good thing is it does make things const because you cannot use one ampersand here, one ampersand would not compile because this is a temporary object. Alto with one ampersand does not, we cannot call. So that's the way we solve it and everything works fine. Great. So the only thing we have to teach is to programmers, forget about const when you declare something. Just declare type and two ampersand. But to some way changes the whole picture of C++ to programmers, I would guess. And uh, that will be interesting about the consequences we have then in, th in this community. So in, I think in the next hour there's, there's a session about how to teach C++. Hmm? Interesting. Good. And, ah, oh, sorry. If we use Alto with two ampersand, so it's not const. Be careful, be careful. There's another problem. The problem is the fact that begin caches means begin is a right call, does modify something. And that means if you have two threads calling begin at the same time, you have a problem. So calling print and sum, so we print out the elements and we want to compute the sum in one thread, maybe not so tricky, but just indirectly over some ways. Yeah, it's, it's all fine until you pass a list into a drop or a vector into a filter. Then this is a runtime error. Uh, that, that compiles, but it's a runtime error, undefined behavior. Okay, filters. Be careful, you cannot use, when you use a filter view, you cannot use const to iterate, but be careful if you do use const, uh, if you don't use const, be careful because also iterating is a problem with the filter. Okay, so uh, in that case, use const auto reference. Good. We have a couple of other options, take by value, uh, and maybe constrain it to be just a view because copying containers is expensive. Maybe you want to pass a container, then use all. Maybe um, you have overloaded a print version for views, they take by value, and other print that take by reference, and call the other print function. Um, okay, I skip that. Because the fun part starts now. So now we come to my favorite filter example, how to use a filter. So I don't know why you use a filter. I use a filter to find elements that have a problem. 
So sometimes this happens, and you want to fix a problem. Do you agree that this is a common use case for a filter? Let's find all the elements that are even. Let's iterate over them and fix them. Well, that's not a fix. That's <laughs> add two for the moment. One, four, ten, ten, seven, six, seven. Okay, let's do it again. Great. Works. Now, let's fix it that they are even. <laughs> so, let's add on the one. Yeah, first time. Second time. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Because the first time we do that, we cache begin. So the next time we use this view, it has a cache begin. That element is definitely processed. And then later on, we don't find an element anymore. But the behavior is interesting. I mean, OK. That's a runtime error. Well, that's, that's unexpected behavior. It's not undefined behavior, that's unexpected behavior. Good. Um, now, we are smart in the standard committee. We said, no, no, that's, uh, that's undefined behavior. That's broken code. Don't do that. Uh, oh, yeah, of course. Um, how, how do we specify that? We say, you know, modif modifications of the elements of a filter view iterator is permitted, but results in undefined behavior if the resulting value does no longer satisfy the predicate. We are fine in the standard committee because we told you so. Okay? Now you know, if you use a filter, you can't use const. So without using const, be careful not to call it currently. And then don't modify elements in some way. Some is okay, some is not. So. <laughs> Patrice Roy said this nice example. So I write my computer game. I want to have find the monsters who are dead and bring them back to life. That's undefined behavior. Yes, don't do that. You only have to know the rules. Burning them is fine. <laughs> Provided they don't come back to life. You never know with monsters that burn. Up to, okay, that's a different thing. So, to be honest here, We have standardized a view in with a filter where the use case, find the broken elements to fix them, does not work. And it's even worse. It compiles and has undefined behavior. So it might look like it works, but it's broken. Sometimes you see it because when you use the view twice, that something strange is going on. Sometimes you might not see it. Sometimes you might only see it with some certain values, and, um, and it's a runtime error. And if there's one thing we just learned in C++, it is that programmers are fed up with unexpected behavior. So we are in a situation where we can no longer say it's up to the programmer to make things right. The problem and the knowledge you need is too big now. That's why we come up with new languages. Okay. Good. Anyway, um, is this all? No. Let's. Um, Let's look at a few other examples. 10 minutes left, so I can use a few more things. So this is, those who have seen my keynote saw that already last year. Um, that's a vector, that's a list. We have four elements. We want to drop the first two elements. That's the specification of our view. Let's uh, insert a new element at the begin, and let's uh, print the values. They are there. Now think about, we are not using drop here, we should use filter here, same problem. But insert new elements, call print again. <laughs> One of those 
has cache begin. One has not. In a filter, all would have cache begin. So we would say, now let's add new, two new elements. But because we have here um, used cache, cache begin, um, yeah, um, we have different output. And what is really crazy, um, a few things here. If you copy the view, the cache is gone. And that also applies to filters. And if you print out the elements earlier, you change the behavior of the program because you cache earlier. And that is really, that, that's, I don't know, I can't believe that anybody in the standard committee thinks this is good design. So we, a print function changes the behavior of a program. That is what we standardized. What? Maybe I'm too old, but I learned caching. Caching is an improvement in performance, but should not have an impact on the functional behavior. Maybe I'm too old. Now, the bad news is, that we have one more problem. <laughs> now, we are not allowed to use const. So when we iterate, we have to use a non-const container. Now, let's use a print here. Well, this is print, but think about we do something else here. This is foo. So we have a great function to make sure you cannot accidentally modify elements. It's called cbegin. We standardize it in C++11. Good. Oh, this does not work on views. Because it's not provided in C24 views. Okay. Ah, yeah, but we have std cbegin. And in C20, we have std ranges cbegin. You can use. Yeah, and then it works. Good. Now let's um, accidentally modify the element. It's not so accidentally here, but <laughs> things like that happen. So, if you pass a view, that compiles. Because the view may or may not propagate const to the elements, and cbegin might not work. So cbegin is broken in C++24 views both forms. Now, the interesting thing is, it's not broken if you <laughs> let the view operate on a temporary object. So on an R value. If you let it operate on an L value, it's broken. On an R value, it works fine. <laughs> what? <laughs> Why? Well, The reason is, think we have a function returning a vector of it. So here we use it to initialize an L value. And then we apply a filter. So we still need the vector. So we have the vector and we have the view on it. And I told you we have a filter view on a C. Well, in practice, by the way, it's a filter view on a ref view on a C, but that's only to separate the mechanisms of uh, using it as a view from what does the view concretely do. So, when you use a temporary collection, not sure why this is red and this is violet, but okay. So, um, then you get a different situation because if you have that, you are creating a view on a temporary object, that temporary object would be destroyed at the end of this statement. So the view would filter elements on a, on a temporary collection. And for that reason, we do something different. We move the returned collection into the view, and that is, instead of a ref view, we, need an, we use an owning view. Now, an owning view has a container as member, while the ref view 
has a container outside. In that case, the usual rules of C++ apply, and they say if the object is const, the member is const. So here, we, here we propagate constness, but here we don't propagate constness, and that leads to the strange behavior you just saw that we have um, what you have seen. So depending on whether you, um, <laughs> you use um, temporary objects or not, const propagation is done. So here's the example. Begin does not work, is not available. C begin is available. Um, ranges C begin is also available. And if you accidentally modify things, that's a compile time error for vectors, but not for views, um, unless you <laughs> take an R value on the right. That is C20 and C23. Ranges C begin is fixed. C begin is not fixed for reasons you don't want to know. But sometimes I think the standard committee hates programmers, but OK. Um, that has an important consequence. Don't use STDC begin since C20 anymore, or in general, in more general. Prefer, if you have a function in STD ranges and in STD, use the one in STD ranges. That's a better one. That also applies to several other rules. Um, sometimes it's easy to teach that. Sometimes it's about fixing a problem you never heard about and I never heard about. So that's it. How do you use a filter view? OK, it's very easy. <laughs> Just follow these advices. So don't iterate when it's const, but that's easy. That's a compile time error. Good. Um, don't concurrently iterate. That's not so easy. That's a runtime error. Um, don't um, don't, and that's really strange. If you modify elements while iterating, make sure the predicate still applies. That's a runtime error. So that's your obligation. Const may or may not be propagated. That is. Um, depending on different use cases, a compile time error, if you're lucky, if you're not lucky, uh, you have uh, unexpected behavior. Iterating might change the state. We've seen that because caching, caching earlier, changed the behavior of the program. And a copy might not have the same state. So what are the consequences? It's pretty easy. Don't use const. Don't use concurrency. Don't modify elements or be very carefully. Um, don't think const is working. Um, and if you copy, um, things might be unexpected. And yeah, so are there still use cases we can use a filter? <laughs> I don't know. That's it. So I'm not sure, yeah, how to use a filter view. Yeah, so now you know how to use a filter view. Well, you know how not to use it. And by the way, all these problems could be fixed, all of them. Each and every could be fixed. We just will have to remove caching. We just have to fix cons correctness. The standard committee thinks that's a bad idea to fix filter views because we have a good reason for the current behavior. Uh, the reason is, in case there is a filter, and behind the filter there's something iterating more than once, and in case your filter elements have a long gap until the first time an element fits the predicate. So if you all have this condition, then this behavior is better. I have a problem with the priorities of the standard committee in the meantime. So, yeah, that's honestly, that's where we are. So, 
if you like this behavior, say thank you to the standard committee. If not, the only way you can do is send bug reports over bug reports. Because you say the filter is not working. I think that's the only way we can fix the broken standard committee. <laughs> thank you very much. And yes, I'm part of the standard committee. I'm broken. <laughs> I said yes. So time is over. Um, I'm here around a little bit, so you can ask me questions, but I think that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>